Oh, maybe, maybe we can get started. Uh, thank you. See, the standing room only, so that's a very good sign. Or maybe it's the food that arrived before the talk this time, or the drinks. So thank you all for coming. I realize this is a readings week which means the students look a little bit more bleary-eyed than they usually do anyway. So, but thank you. I know it's a very busy time for you. Um, I, would, uh, I would like to take a moment to particularly thank Roberta Buffett, Elliot, and David Elliott for coming out and flying out from the West Coast. Although the good part is you get to fly back to California, so that's, that's a nice part of it. Um, I'd also like to just take a minute to thank Roberta Buffett uh, for everything that uh, she's put into the center. Um, yesterday evening, we had the opportunity to have dinner with some of the undergraduates who are doing some fantastic work around here, and truly impressive. Um, but it's much more than that. We also, of course, have the graduate student reach out. We have workshops, we have faculty exchanges, and of course, the Buffett Visiting Professor Lecture today. Um, there's, there's so much going on on the Buffett Center. Many of you will have consulted our website. And many of us here, if not all of us here, uh, certainly through an occasion like this one, uh, has profited from her generosity. And I think Bertie Buffett has set out a, 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 um, an objective to make Northwestern a global university and to help in any which way possible. Uh, and I think we're really getting to that point where in some schools, more than half of the undergraduates travel abroad. Um, we have graduate students in about every corner of the world, faculty exchanges everywhere, many, many places, uh, literally hundreds of programs that are being developed at Northwestern or already in place. And I think that's in great part due to the generosity of donors like Bertie Buffett. So thank you very much on behalf of the center and all of us here and the entire Northwestern community. Thank you. Um, it is uh, to some extent an occasion of firsts because this is the first time I get to introduce President Shapiro who's uh, attending his first Buffett visiting professor uh, lecture. So I would like to turn the floor over to President Shapiro who would like to address you in, in his own person. So thank you very much, President Shapiro. Welcome to Moscow. Thank you. thank you. This is going to be very brief because I'm dying to hear from the ambassador. No pressure. No pressure. Uh, I just, I, Hedrick mentioned that this is a much more of a globalized university than maybe some people are aware of. It's certainly more globalized than I thought. And one of the great pleasant surprises and virtually all the surprises for me and for Mimi over the last six and a half months since we moved here um, have been positive, almost no negative. If you want to know the negative, buy me a beer and I'll tell you. Uh, but I can tell you among the many, many, many positive uh, surprises has been the intellectual and uh, international engagement that we have here at Northwestern. And Hendrik just mentioned the uh, faculty efforts and all the other things that are going on here, study abroad. The only thing I want to say, and I say this because Bertie and David and I had the great pleasure of having dinner last night with a group of students all operating under the auspices of the Buffett Center who are just changing the world in a remarkable way. I mean, just organizing conferences like the great Globe Med one that we had over the weekend with Paul Farmer's stirring uh, keynote in front of a thousand mainly students there in the audience to all the other conferences that go on. And it's just it's staggering that the students are so entrepreneurial here. Uh, they really understand that with the great, <clears throat> the great privilege of being here at Northwestern, they also comes with great, great responsibility, and they're exercising that responsibility brilliantly. So again, I also, of course, want to thank David and Bertie for their visionary support, but I mainly want to just acknowledge the unbelievable students we have at Northwestern. I've never been so blessed to be at a place like this, so thank you. I'll uh, keep my introductory remarks brief, but I do want to say a few things about uh, Ambassador Williamson. I'll have to take out my crib notes, because it's a long list of which I'll try to pick a few things out. Uh, first of all, he got his uh, BA degree at Princeton, JD at University of Virginia, and then entered into public service, where he truly accomplished a stellar record. Um, most recently, he was special envoy under the last Bush administration, special envoy to Sudan, so very appropriate given the topic that we'll discuss today. But prior to that, and I'll just mention a few things uh, to illustrate his, his truly remarkable record. Uh, special Assistant to the President on the Ronald Reagan's uh, tenure. Uh, Deputy, the Chief of Staff on the Ronald Reagan as well. Um, diplomatic Post, just a few. Ambassador to the United Nations offices in Vienna. 
including the International Atomic Energy Agency, Assistant Secretary of State for International Organization Affairs, Ambassador to the United Nations for Special Political Affairs, um, Ambassador to the UN Commission on Human Rights, and so on, um, head of the delegation to the Organization of Security and Cooperation in Europe. And that's only you know, the list at the federal level. He was also on many, many things at the state political level, uh, many organizations, I believe chairman of the Illinois Republican Party at some point too. Um, a very, very long list of accomplishments and truly a public servant of the first order. Um, in between, apparently he had too much time on his hands, so he wrote seven books, edited three, and 180 articles, and he probably wrote an article during this introduction. Um, <laughs> but it used to be said of Harry Johnson that he could write an article while waiting for a plane. I think um, uh, uh, Williamson might be another one. Um, um, so uh, the topic at hand today is, is a somewhat serious one, not somewhat serious, a very serious one in the sense of um, the events that of course have taken place in this past decade in Rwanda, Sudan, or the Congo, um, uh, raising the question of our responsibility, and particularly the responsibility to protect, as it's called now. Uh, to what extent do we have obligations to intervene in atrocities or potential genocide? And that is, I think, the topic of today that Ambassador Williamson has no other is capable and competent of discussing. So uh, on that note, let me uh, turn it over to um, Ambassador Williamson, whose title of today's talk is in the, face, uh, in the Face of Mass Murder and Atrocities, What Should America Do? Um, Richard, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. thank you very much. It's really has been a pleasure to be associated with Northwestern uh, this year and uh, appreciate that introduction. When I hear an introduction like that, I think of uh, something that happened to me when I was a senior in college. Like most seniors, they have no idea what they want to do. I took the uh, LSATs because I didn't know what I wanted to do. And I called my dad. Well, my dad ran a small business, 16 employees in Skokie, Illinois. And like most business people, they knew that businesses created jobs, made something, helped drive the country. And so I was a little nervous because he knew lawyers did none of those things. <laughs> so I called him with some trepidation and said, Dad, I'm thinking of going to uh, law school. And there's this long pause because he tried to be positive and this was taxing him. And there's a pause that it probably was about five or ten seconds, seemed like a minute or two to me, and he said, that's okay, it could be worse, you could go work for the government. <laughs> <coughs> True story. Also, I just have to say, uh, Hedrick's uh, reverence to uh, my former Titleist ambassador story. I'm up in Quebec with uh, former Senator Adlai Stevenson, and we're both supposed to speak and the premier of uh, Quebec province, the, the governor, if you will, at the end of the luncheon, just before we were going to speak, says, Rich, how do you want me to introduce you? And I said, I'd prefer Rich, but if you want to call me a funny name, go ahead. <laughs> Adley, who I know well, and he's a great guy, goes, I want to be called Senator. And I took the premier back. He says, reminds me of a story. When Juan Perón made a trip, his first trip to Madrid after uh, marrying Eva. He was in the first car with Franco, and there's long lines of people cheering, yay, hooray, as they went by. Eva was four cars back, standing up with a very distinguished man with gray hair. And as she went by, they were screaming, whore, slut, prostitute. After about 10 minutes, the distinguished man turned to her and said, don't worry, dear, I retired long ago, but they still call me general. <laughs> I want to thank uh, Roberta Buffett Elliott very much for all you've done for uh, Northwestern. I grew up in Winnetka, went to football games and uh, and basketball games growing up, but like most people that live that close, it was too close to home to go to. The same thing afflicted my kids, but fortunately two of them after college came back here to go to Kellogg and had a fantastic experience. And I think benefited uh, enormously. 
And the difference between daughters and sons, my daughter's my firstborn. She came here, took every academic advantage, and, if I can brag, graduated as the top student in management. My son, <laughs> he came here, had a great experience, and lowered his golf game by six strokes. <laughs> but we, lo we love Northwestern, both Jane and I, and we've enjoyed it, and this has been great fun to be associated with it. President Shapiro, congratulations on your new uh, position. You're leading one of the great universities, and uh, we all wish you well. And I want to thank Hedrick and uh, Brian and other colleagues who've been so kind to me while I've been here. Now, I'm not a scholar, so I'm going to bring a practitioner's perspective, um, which is slightly different, but hopefully is of some interest and somewhat informative. Earlier, Bertie had commented she was glad uh, after we met that she'd be able to understand me, because some of my predecessors apparently had thick accents. I said, I barely speak English, but you'll be able to understand me. I think. <laughs> The fact is that mass atrocities and murder are too common. They're too horrific and something should be done. More should be done. The last hundred years has been the world's bloodiest and the statistics are overwhelming. Professor Roger Smith from William and Mary estimates that over 50 million persons have been victims of genocide since 1900. Peter uh, Sheriff estimates even higher numbers. Under Mao Zedong, China in 56 to 61, 66 to 69, and Tibet in the 50s, over 30 million people perished. Stalin from the purges in the Ukraine famine, over 23 million people perished. We have Hitler's genocide. The Armenian genocide in Turkey, 1.2 million Armenians from 1915 to 1920. Pol Pot, 1.7 million people in a country that just had more than 4 million, more than one quarter of the population. Kim Il-sung, 1.6 million in North Korea, and so on. Benjamin Valentino, a professor who's studied this and written about this subject, Estimates that between 60 million and 150 million people probably have perished in episodes of mass killing during the 20th century alone. By comparison, international, civil war, international and civil wars have accounted for approximately 34 million. So two to six times more have perished in mass killings than in war. But statistics don't tell the entire story. Stati statistics never do. To grasp the savagery, the horror, the inhumanity, you must hear the stories. Listen to the voices of those who've lived in times of terrible terror, who have given witness to the murder, mayhem, and misery. Just as survivors, every remembrance is seared by memories of when the gates of hell were opened. So too should we recall the stories of death, destruction, and despair as we reflect on how the United States, how America, should respond to mass murder and atrocities today. In June 2002, my embassy driver in Bosnia, Milenko Milinovic, who was Croatian and was a policeman before the war, told me that his five-year-old son became so hungry during the siege of Sarajevo that he ate grass. In 2002, he was 11 years old. His father told me that when he asks his son about the war, his son can remember very little. But most nights, he wakes up screaming from nightmares. Manal Elshar, a Bosniak, was manager of the KPMG office in Sarajevo when we sat down for dinner in 2003. She too was in Sarajevo during the surge. She told me that in 1992, when the war started, 
someone wrote on a building in her neighborhood, this is Serbia. Someone wrote below it, no stupid, this is a post office. At first things were confusing, she told me, but rising violence focused the mind. When I asked her if it, what it was like with sniper fire and mortar shells exploding for three years, no electricity, no heat, little water or food, she told me people fought for normalcy. Quote, we went to work. We found routes down the narrow back streets that were safer where snipers on the hill did not have a clear shot. She told me that while she and her husband worked near to one another each morning at home, they would say goodbye and then take different routes to their respective offices. They never said it, but they understood that way there was less chance they both would be killed that day. When friends came to their apartment to visit, Manel told me no matter how late the hour, one never told the guest it was late and they should be on their way. They would wait and allow their guests to decide when they would depart. That way, she told me, if a sniper killed them on their way home, they had chosen their time, not she. One day, Manal saw a woman carrying her baby down a street in Sarajevo. The child was killed by a Serbian sniper, she told me. The woman sat down in that spot and cried and cried. The sniper could have killed the mother too. He did not. Why? He wanted to create hatred so Serbia would be let go, she told me. And the damage does not end when the killing stops. Societies torn asunder by mass killing and atrocities do not heal overnight. There is fragility due to lingering fear. There is anger, hatred, a thirst for vengeance. There is a lack of faith in society's institutions, including the rule of law. Manel told me that she had a five-year-old son born after the war. He asks her what happened to the buildings as he points to where bullets and shrapnel gouged the walls. Manel said, I tell him he should know, but I worry. What am I passing on? 2002 and 2003, reminders of the carnage during Sierra Leone's bloody civil war were not from pock holes on buildings as I drove down streets in Freetown. The testament to terror on every single block were the young men and women, many of them former boy soldiers, standing or sitting on every corner with one or more limbs missing. But let me turn to Sudan, where I've devoted a great deal of time in my last assignment, where two million people perished in the longest civil war in Africa's history, the North-South Civil War, and over four million were displaced. And in Darfur, where two to 400,000 have died in 2.7 million now live in IDP camps and refugee camps in desperate conditions. The government of Sudan that had prosecuted the long North-South Civil War that began when they tried to spread Sharia law in the 50s to the South that was mostly animist, some Christians, the Arabs versus non-Arabs in the South. They developed a technique they later used in Darfur. They armed local militia, the so-called Junjawi, the devils on horseback and camels. They identified non-Arab villages. Now let me first say, they're all of dark complexion. To the end of my time, my multiple times in Sudan, looking at someone who was Arab versus African, I could never tell the difference. But if you called them one or the other, they were very insulted, and they point to some minor facial characteristic. 
But it was the non-Arabs in the West that began a small uprising where two air, air, aircraft were destroyed and a handful of soldiers were killed. In response, be, instead of a targeted proportional response, they tried to drain the fish, i.e. the rebels swam in, or as the president Debe of Chad once said to me to get the bird, they cut down the tree. And so what they did with the village was first over it went attack helicopters or Russian fighter planes that would fire bullets, sometimes dumping 55 gallon drums of burning oil on the innocent people below. It was followed by the devils on horseback and camel, the Janjaweed coming in, along with truck, flatbed trucks with Sudan armed forces. They'd shoot indiscriminately, they would kill, they would poison wells, they would destroy the crops, they would steal the livestock, they would kill males from two and three year olds to 85 year olds and beat and gang rape women. And then they'd take burning hot knives and put it on the woman's thigh so her husband and family would not let her back in because she was branded for having been raped by an Arab. There is evil. While the President's Special Envoy to Sudan, I often traveled to IDB camps near Nayala, El Fasher, and elsewhere. I'd spend hours at each camp. Slowly, I was able to get reluctant women to tell me their stories. Typical was a visit I had in Otash IDP camp outside Nayala in southern Darfur. It was a camp originally built for 2,000. It now has 60,000 people clinging to life. In a room this size, you'd have literally hundreds of people living under plastic sheets. Nayuza was 40 years old when we visited. Her story was similar to countless others. She came from Tawala village, about 75 kilometers northwest of Otash camp. Three and a half years earlier, her village was ransacked. Sometimes, she told me, quote, sometime near midnight, they were attacking. I heard gunshots when I went outside to see there were men on camels and horses shooting their guns. For five days, they were looting, and they were burning, and they were beating us. And when a woman in Darfur says she was beaten, it means she was raped. She told me, quote, many were killed, many died. I left many relatives behind. They were dead. The village is gone. She told me they walked nine days into the desert. It was very hot, very difficult. But Nayoza told me we had no choice. I asked if she planned to return home. Nayoza said, quote, we don't think about going home. Of course, it would be good. But who would bring the security? It is not safe. Yes, I hope the international community can provide the security. That is my hope. I know the government will not bring security. I do not expect that. So it is better to try to live here, to survive. No, I try to think about, I, I never try to think about going home. It just makes me too sad. Trauma, clinging to life, no hope. I want to let you indulge me by reading two excerpts uh, from books that tell stories that are even more searing. The first is a, from a woman by the name of Halima Bashir. After I read uh, her book, I arranged for her to come to the White House and we met with the President in the Oval Office. She's about 4'11", about uh, 95 pounds, and she's a medical doctor. She's a Zagawa whose father was rich. He had 12 cattle. So he was able to send her 
to school in a village, a half day's walk away for high school, and then she went to university. While she was there, the fighting broke in Darfur. And while the Zakawa are Muslim, they're considered African, and so they've been targets of the purge. When she was done, she was sent to a small, isolated village to work a clinic by herself with few supplies. She'd been there a few weeks when this happened. Two weeks later, I was sitting in front of the clinic, almost as if we were holding, almost as if the village was holding its breath. Suddenly, I caught sight of a crowd of people surging out of the marketplace. They turned as one and started running in our direction. Among them were figures carrying heavy burdens in their arms. I could quite tell what at this distance. I realized finally what they were holding. It was the girls, the girls from the school. I caught the look of pain and rage on the faces of the adults, and I could hear the pitiful cries of the girls. I caught sight of one of the women teachers, but she seemed to be clawing at her face and hair, as if driven out of her mind. As the crowd enveloped us, I realized that the school girls were ripping and dirtied their uniforms and streaked in blood. My God, what had happened? What had happened? What in God's name had happened? The cries were all around me, confusing and deafening. I tried to make sense of the words. Breasts, attack the school, monsters, the devil himself, children, raped. In spite of everything, the shock, the confusion, the trauma, my medical training took over now. I reached for the little girl's face, one side of which was swollen and bloodied. I probed around the wound. She had been hit with an instrument, probably a rifle butt, and needed stitches. But there were other, more urgent priorities. I checked her eyes. They were dead and glazed in shock, unseen. I lifted up her dress. It was slick with congealed blood. As gently as I could, I tried to pry apart her shaking, bloodied knees. The soft child's skin of her thighs was crisscrossed with cut marks, as if a pack of wild animals had been clawing at her. I felt her body stiffen, her leg muscles tightening and resisting as that chilling, empty, wailing in her throat rose to a terrified scream. I felt wave after wave of panic, sweeping thought throughout her. No, 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 again, not again, not again. I tried to talk to her. I'm sorry, little sister, but I have to look. It's Dr. Halima from the medical clinic. I have to look. I have to, but I won't hurt you or do anything nasty, I promise. She took care of 50 young girls, the youngest of which was seven. She had no anesthetic. That's the reality. That's what happens. That's what these women and men and boys must live through. Let me read one other thing and then I'll go back. And this is um, a great book of the translator. This is a Zakawa who became a translator for investigators and journalists in Darfur. And this is one story he tells, there are many in the book, but I think it captures the desperation, the victimization, and why we have to do more. He was in North Darfur, 
He was talking to a man. The village had been attacked and destroyed a few months before. Quote, everybody ran away as fast as they could. My wife over there had held our two-year-old son tightly in her arms. And she ran one way through the bushes. Thank God she found a good way to go. I took my four-year-old daughter, Amma, and we ran as fast as we could another way around the bushes. They caught me, the gingerweed, and I let go of her hand and told her to run. But she didn't keep running. She watched from some bushes as they beat me and tied me to a tree with my arms tied behind my back. One of the Junjuan men started to kill me in a painful way. My daughter could not bear to see this. So she ran toward me and called out, Abba, Abba. These words, which mean daddy, daddy, filled his throat with emotion and he paused a long time. The Junjuan men who had tied me up to the tree saw my daughter running to me. He lowered his rifle and he let her run into the bayonet. He gave it a big push. The blade went all the way through her stomach. She still cried out to me, Abba, Abba. Then he lifted up his gun with my daughter on it, with blood from her body pouring down all over him. He danced around with her in the air and shouted to his friends, look, see how fierce I am. And they danced back to him. They chanted back to him, yes, yes, you are fierce, 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 as they were killing other people. My daughter looked at me for help and stretched her arms in great pain toward me. She, she tried to say Abba, but nothing came out. It took a long time for her to die, her blood coming down so fresh and red on this. What was he? A man? A devil? He was painted wet, red with my little girl's blood and he was dancing. What was he? End of quote. The man had seen evil and didn't know what to do with the sight of it. He was looking for an answer to what it was and why the little girl deserved this. Then, after taking some time to cry without talking, he told me he no longer knew who he was. Quote, Am I a woman who should stay in this camp, or a man who should go fight and leave my wife and son without protection? He looked at me as if I should know the answer to his life now. He wanted waited for an answer that I could not give. You are still alive, I said. They didn't kill you. What is a better torture than this, he snapped. What was better torture than that, to have to tell my wife and my son this? I think it's important when you talk about the proliferation of atrocities that seem to have picked up speed at the end of the last century. The Cambodian killing fields were in the late 70s, but then in the 90s, you had Rwanda, Bosnia, Kosovo, Eastern Democratic Republic of the Congo, the beginning of the uh, violence in Darfur. And these are the only the most notable and our response has been anemic. Professor Eric Weitz of the University of Minnesota has written an interesting and well-documented book, A Century of Genocide, Utopias of Race and Nation, in which he examines four of the major genocides of the 20th century. Soviet Union under Stalin, Nazi Germany, Cambodia under the Khmer Rouge, in the former Yugoslavia. In his conclusion, he writes, the genocides discussed in this book were not about eruptions of age-old hatreds, nor the results of individuals and groups acting solely on their own accord. 
The killings took place within the larger framework of revolutionary politics centered on the reshaping of the composition of society. However random some of the killings, however arbitrary the fate of an individual victim or survivor, the actions always involved some level of planning and unfolded without a larger, within a larger regime context of domination and exclusion. The genocide occurred at times of extreme social crisis, often generated by the very policies of the regime. Although total wars, revolutionary politics, and ideologies of race and nation all provide critical historical context, illuminating the depth and frequency of the 20th century genocides, in the end, such massive violations of human rights were the results of political decisions. There was nothing inevitable about any of these crises. Echoing that sentiment, something I agree with, with is something Professor Benjamin Valento of Dartmouth wrote in his book, Final Solutions, Mass Killing and Genocide in the 20th Century. He finds that ethnic hatreds of discrimination, undemocratic systems of government, and dysfunctions in society play a much smaller role in mass killing and genocide than is commonly assumed. He shares that the impetus for mass killing usually originates from a relatively small group of powerful leaders. And it's often carried out without the active support of the broader society. Mass killing, in his view, is a brutal political and military strategy designed to accomplish leaders' most important objectives, counter threats to their power, and solve their most difficult problems. That makes it in some ways even more evil, but it also means that there are rational people trying to hold on to power with whom you can engage and change the contours of their world. Lieutenant, Lieutenant General Romero de Lera was the former commander of the UN assistance mission for Rwanda, played by Nick Nolte in Hotel Rwanda. When the gates of hell opened and 800,000 Tutsis were murdered by Hutus in 100 days in 1945, he has written a searing account of those days of horror, shake hands with the devil, the failure of humanity in Rwanda. I've spent time with him. He is a tortured man from those days. In his book, he concludes, my own mea culpa is that as the person charged with the military leadership of Unimur, I was unable to persuade the international community that this tiny, poor, overpopulated country and its people were worth saving from the horror of genocide, even when the measures needed for success were relatively small. Still, at, the, at its heart, the Rwanda story is the story of humanity's failure to heed a call for help from an endangered people. The international community of which the UN is only a symbol failed to move beyond self-interest for the sake of Rwanda. So what can we do? We've come a long way in trying to develop skills and mechanisms for restorative justice to heal these societies, to provide some accountability, for recording stories so the horrors can't be denied. And it may serve in part as a deterrent. What we haven't done is taking steps to prevent genocide. We have to enhance the United States' preventive action. There are challenges of the new realities of rising new regional and global powers, China, Brazil, India, and others. Increased potential from competition 
insecurity and friction, economic and otherwise. Complex politi political and economic couplings within and outside regions. Note China's role in both Iran and, and Sudan. The challenges of resources, especially for the Europeans dependent on Russia. The United States dependence on Middle East oil, etc. Lay over that the spread of the weapons of mass destruction, nuclear Korean breakout, the rise of a Shia Iran destabilizing the Middle East, the ongoing conflicts within Pakistan and India. We have to do more to proactively reduce these risks. As I say, the specific uh, their specific threats can be dealt with by strengthening our non-proliferation regime, strengthening restrictions on weapon transfer, restricting the potential influence of dangerous non-state actors, crime syndicates, illicit drug traffic, terror networks. We can help by providing meaningful economic development especially agricultural development. It's time, instead of just providing money, that we assist in good governance, bringing the rule of law and democracy, rules, norms on the use of force, respect for human rights, military and economic cooperation, functioning, functional integration, effective arbitration mechanisms, that all has to be part of our foreign policy. But when you focus on the mass murders and atrocities, we have to do a better job of redressing specific sources that drives the instability and potential conflict. Assisting states or groups that are threatened. A range of diplomatic, military, economic, and legal measures are available and should be used. Diplomatic persuasion and mediation should be engaged. Economic incentives and assistance, military support. There are a range of steps, diplomatic condemnation and isolation, various economic sanctions, legal action, preventive military deployment, threats of punitive action, crisis mitigation, instruments and techniques to manage, mitigate the crisis, identify and empower moderates, isolate or, <clears throat> or uh, deter potential spoilers, sway at the uncommitted, observer missions, PK, peacekeeping operations, arms embargoes. But to do this, first we have to be better at creating clear and convincing early warning of crisis in time to take effective action as we saw with the I think they call them the underwear bomber at Christmas time in Detroit. We don't share information even among the 16 intelligence institutions. And they don't share information with the State Department. And they don't share information with the actors that are on the ground. Why so long after 9-11 is this still a problem? We have to... Uh, possess the necessary tools and resources to make a difference, but in the end, we have to have the political will to react constructively. Political will is not fixed. It's a changing variable that can be nurtured and or squandered. I have had the good fortune of public service. I've sat in that situation room many times. There was information we could have acted, we did not. There needs to be a political will, and that means establishing a precedent to act in certain situations, as opposed to a precedent not to act. In Rwanda, a call was made by the UN ambassador across the street. The ambassador was Madeleine Holbright, she called the head of peacekeeping, Kofi Annan. She was under instructions from Washington, and her message was, 
If you propose a peacekeeping force in Rwanda, we will veto. America said we would veto. Now France, for whom this had been a colony, also ran and hid, as did others. But the United States of America, with our value system, have that on our conscience. It's one reason I suggest to you that we took proactive and helpful action in Bosnia and in Kosovo. But we have to create a precedent where there's an expectation of action, where there's a public awareness in politics. And I will say, on Darfur, their activist community is amazing. When I took, uh, when I agreed to be the President's Special Envoy to Sudan, I got nearly a million emails from activists all over the country. I have to say, I wasn't really pleased at the time. <laughs> but it was good. It showed this commitment out there, and that in turn was passed on to Capitol Hill. The constituents interested in Sudan did something fascinating in the year 2000. They went and organized Methodist churches in Texas and Episcopal churches in Tennessee. So whether Al Gore had won or George Bush, there was a community they knew that they had faith in, who had access, who would ring the bell. And that was part of the reason George Bush became the first president to take actual steps to end the North-South Civil War and appoint my predecessor, Senator Jack Danforth, as a special envoy. It matters. But also, part of political will is the norms and expectations. When and how early warnings reach the relevance, decision makers, what are the organizational factors to respond, making it easy to make the right decision, and having a menu of options of tools of cost-benefit analysis and risks. Excuse me. I just want to talk briefly to say before I go to the responsibility to protect. Coercive action intervention has a wide menu of which boots on the ground is only the last most desperate step. There are interventions that are diplomatic, from demarches to public rebuke to isolation. There's the capacity to sanction and if you can't do it in the Security Council because of China or whatever, you have unilateral ones and you can do it with partners. Today, Sudan can do no financial dealings through Europe. It had not, we could not get that through the UN Security Council. The US did it, then we worked with our allies. They now have to go through Malaysia. It's more expensive and less reliable for them. Does that break their back? No, but it increases the cost. But also, there are other coercive steps. You don't have to go immediately to the most extreme. You can control transportation routes, reinforce peacekeeping operations, impose no-fly zones, create arms embargoes, jam communications, precision targeting strikes, blockades. The Sudan Armed Forces haven't won an open battle in years. They tip the scale because of air superiority and they only have 32 planes and helicopters. A no-fly zone over an area of Darfur the size of Texas is impractical and you'd have to go from Benjamina in Chad. But we have the capacity to shoot a missile from the Persian Gulf that can blow up a single plane, and that would get their attention. Not one American would be at risk. It would change the equation.
Yes, these steps take certain risks, but we have to ask ourselves, are we unwilling to take even these modest steps to avoid the type of horror which I described earlier? Last year, there, or 2008, a report came out headed by Madeleine Albright and Bill Cohen, Preventing Genocide, a Blueprint for U.S. Policymakers, that elaborates on many of these steps. Um, but I go back on my experience that the most important thing is a will, and, a will and willingness to act. And so let me turn just finally, and I'm sorry I've gone on so long, to talk about the responsibility to protect. As you all know, sovereignty is a bedrock of modern international relations for hundreds of years. In 1996, Francis Dang, interestingly a former foreign minister of Sudan, was at Brookings and with colleagues he wrote a book that came up with the idea that just as there are privileges for our government because of sovereignty, that they can't be interfered with from the outside willy-nilly. There are also responsibilities, and the responsibilities are to protect their own people. In 2002, the African Union was formed, and in their con uh, Constitutive Act, Article 4H, it stipulates, quote, the right of the Union to intervene in a member state pursuant to a decision of the assembly in respect to grave circumstances, na namely war crimes, genocide, crimes against humanity. So the AU became the first international body to embrace the idea of responsibility to protect and that it was okay to pierce sovereignty to protect. 2002 also, there was a Canadian commission, the International Commission on Intervention and state sovereignty that gave rhetorical framework for the responsibility to protect. In 2005, there was the largest gathering of world leaders in history at the United Nations in September at the beginning of the General Assembly. And an outcomes document was uh, adopted. Unfortunately, like almost all these diplomatic documents, it is too big, it has scores of articles and tries to cover too many issues, so there's all kinds of trade-offs. But in paragraph 138 and 139, by consensus, these world leaders, including the United States, accepted that there was a responsibility of a government to protect its citizens. And when the government failed for the international community, to act to help protect it. So what? There are tough issues of sovereignty, especially for the weak. The history of North-South colonialism has created a template where there are legitimate fears by the weaker countries that this might be used to re uh, colonize them, and obviously the events in Iraq did not help. There's a question of legitimacy. In the outcomes document, it says the only body that can act to authorize a responsibility to protect intervention is the UN Security Council problematic. First of all, nobody in the world today would pick the five permanent members as the five permanent members. In fact, there was a security council one time, the Chinese ambassador came up to me and said, you know, Rich, it's very interesting. Looking at the permanent five, he said, you got one superpower, one race, rising power, and three collapsed powers. A little bit of an overstatement, but if I were Brazil, Egypt, uh, India, I think there's some truth to it. And you have this veto power. What happened in Kosovo? Having learned a lesson from Rwanda, the Clinton administration was committed and willing to engage to try to stop the ethnic slaughter of the Albanians in Kosovo. 
Russia, because of their political relationship and history with Serbia, said, we will veto. One day, when the Security Council began meeting at 10, at about 10.15, Ambassador Richard Holbrook stood up and said, 15 minutes ago, the United States began to bomb Kosovo. Five minutes earlier, NATO passed a resolution authorizing it. That's good enough. So the whole question of international organizations, legitimacy, acceptability, et cetera, are on the table. The problems that are inherent in the UN have to be addressed. But I would argue, just like President Clinton made the decision in Kosovo, there are times, as long as we can get a base of international partners, we should be willing to act. Because sovereignty, the fear of colonialism, legitimacy to act are all problems, but I would suggest the biggest problem are those that are able to act are unwilling to. It's fascinating, when it was the best security council, you'd sit around and these other 14 countries would talk, and they'd talk about what we should do, what we should do, what we should do, and then I'd look around and say, well, we're the only ones with the power to do it. And for a variety of reasons I won't go into, the United States is the only country that can project power anywhere in the world. If we're going to go in a region, we should get partners within that region can, that can project power. But in the end, the United States has to make certain decisions and bear certain responsibilities for mass murder and atrocities in the world today. Yes, build capacity, develop early warning, develop a menu and instruments for the Secretary General to report and provide to the Security Council, but in the end, there has to be a willingness to act. It's a long way to build a road with sturdy guardrails, but it's worth it. Let me just end by saying we have to remember as Americans we've made incredible mistakes. Nonetheless, we were founded on the principles of human rights. The first thing in the Declaration of Independence is not a recitation of grievances. It's that mankind had certain inalienable rights. And those values should animate U.S. foreign policy. With respect to mass murder and atrocities, it's in the U.S. interest to act because we need stability because we have interest worldwide. The refugee flows from these type of terrible situations are destabilizing, not only to the countries, but to the neighbors. Failing and failed states that result from these type of mass atrocities can help breed and become home of terror, crime cartels, and proliferation. Economically, we lose opportunities in the disruption, the inability to get certain resources. There's environmental degradation Unfortunately, these become hotbeds of pandemic, uh, pandemic disease. Most of the people in Darfur have not died from being killed, but from dehydration and disease. But I would say, yes, it is, we have to be realistic, practical, pragmatic, proportional. We have to engage, we have to talk, we have to seek multilateral co cooperation. We have to not be blinded by rigid ideology, got to try to be reasonable and rational and realistic. But values matter. They matter more to us historically than any country. It's who we are. It's what binds us. Henry Kissinger, the ultimate realist in the last hundred years, the Metternich of the 20th century, wrote when Peter Roskam died, a mutual friend, that people try to say you either have to be a realist or an idealist. And Kissinger wrote, you don't. You have to be realist to deal with today. You have to be an idealist to know where you're going. So for those that disparage values, that disparage the importance of being true to them, we have to and we can do better. In the late 90s, I was at Kedans, Poland for a conference called 1989, 10 years later. 
It was principally Central and Eastern Europeans meeting in Kdansk on the 10th anniversary of the fall of the Berlin Wall. It was a fascinating few days. Brent Scowcroft and I were there for the United States. First thing we did the first morning was to go to the shipyard because Kdansk is where the Solidarity Movement began to pay our respect. It was fascinating through those few days. I love this one guy from uh, uh, Latvia who opened up a laptop computer to take notes. It was the president of Latvia. He was 38. And at that time, I didn't even know how to work email. And this guy was. I mean, they were trying to figure out how to make this work. On the last night, the president of Poland had a dinner for about 30 of us. The president of Lithuania stood up and turned to the president of Solidarity, who was in attendance. He said, I want to toast you. When I was a freedom fighter at home, I'd look to the bravery of the Solidarity Movement and get courage to go on. And at night, I'd come home to my apartment, my one-room apartment. I'd go from corner to corner with a little transistor radio trying to pick up Radio Free Europe because I wanted to hear what you were doing. It kept us going. And here we are today. I want to toast you. We stood up and toast. Then the president of Solidarity stood up. He turned to me because he knew I'd worked with President Reagan. And he said, you know, during those dark days standing up to the totalitarian boot, we too needed inspiration. We too listened to Radio Free Europe. And all of us could quote the following. We are engaged in a great struggle, and it will not be won by bombs or guns or battleships. It'll be won by the battle of ideas, the great ideas, freedom, liberty, faith in God, rule of law. And then he said, those were the words of President Reagan at Westminster Hall. Now, who said him doesn't matter? What it said was it reflected the character and how important it is to other countries. And there's no place it's needed more than trying to step up and accept our responsibility to protect. Thank you. We still have a few minutes, so if you could raise your hand and be acknowledged, then Ambassador Williamson will field your questions. Yes, sir. Uh, half a century ago, uh, America killed more than two million Vietnamese. Yeah. When do we begin accepting responsibility for that act? I'm sorry, I thought, maybe I forgot to, but I thought I said we've made many mistakes in our 250 well, years. And some of them are specifics, horrific. The specifics, we still haven't borne any responsibility for dealing with those families. You know, we should be using more mirrors and less windows. You know, when I was at the first day at the UN Commission on Human Rights, the Chinese ambassador was very upset. They were upset we could introduce a resolution going to some of their abuses. And they did everything to stop us from doing this. And uh, Demarche is all over the world, complaints in Washington, but in the end, Colin Powell said, no, we're going to go ahead and do it, because we had not done it the last year. And um, the silence of, of the United States and others on human rights is profound because it lets those who abuse human rights think they can go even further next time. So I tabled, this guy gave a similar speech, and again, we've made lots of mistakes. And he used the thing, we should, you should, Ambassador Williamson, you should get a mirror. So during lunch, I went out and bought a mirror, and at the beginning of the afternoon session, I gave it to him. Look, I'm not here to defend our mistakes. I'm acknowledging that there are many of them. If you're suggesting because of those, we shouldn't do anything to stop the atrocities in Darfur, I disagree. If you're saying because of those, we should do nothing to stop the mass atrocities in Eastern Congo, I disagree. So, yeah, we've made mistakes. There are things we should do better. We should do more for reconciliation. We should be more to help those that we've abused. Good Lord, 
Look at how we mishandled the post-conflict situation in Iraq and the suffering that was caused. But Sunday, the beginning of a miracle happened with hundreds of thousands of people under threat of death training and going and working as poll workers and poll watchers and millions of Iraqis, including Sunnis, who had sat out five years ago, going to the polls. So I concede the mistake, sir. I think it's great if you want to try to push for the U.S. government to give, uh, uh, make amends in any way that you feel is right. I don't think it goes to the argument of why we shouldn't pick up our responsibility. I don't think those failures make it okay for us not to act. Um, I think the question was why in those countries where there are atrocities taking place there's a reluctance to give more assistance. And part of that is who do you give it to? In Sudan today the United States provides almost two billion dollars of assistance a year, over one billion of food aid to the World Food Program, as well as developmental assistance. None of it can go through the government. The government chokes off the World Food Program, uh, limits visas, doesn't renew them, interrupts routes, et cetera, but you try to kind of make do. So sometimes there's real problems. In uh, Eastern Congo, it's a devilishly difficult place to work in. Um, I've been in Kisangani, I've been in Naturi. There's no way to get there except a helicopter or by foot. And we're talking an area a thousand miles inland from Kinshasa. So sometimes there are those difficulties. But I do think more generally the United States uh, has to uh, improve its uh, aid programs. I think <laughs> that uh, President Obama correctly has identified agricultural development as an area we've moved away from that we should re-engage because it not only creates subsistence but gives economic growth and most of these countries the largest occupation is agriculture. So, and I also think that uh, President Bush was right to try to identify rewarding countries that did more on governance, education, et cetera. Not a development expert, but I do, I do recommend if you have an interest to look at what Obama has suggested in agricultural development because it's important. A couple observations. It's a fascinating time uh, to be in an academic environment, to be a student, because there are seismic shifts going in the global relationships. Um, I think, at least for the foreseeable future, for decades, America will still have a primacy. Um, it's the only uh, country with uh, military might to project. But relatively, it's going to change, of course, with the emergence of uh, China. Brazil, India, whether the European Union can figure out how to deal with Greece and get their act together is a good question, whatever. But there's changes going on. Second, I think um, we also should recognize that some countries, especially the Nordics and particularly Norway, have been incredible leaders in this area and disproportionately uh, are very generous and also they're very practical because they target it on two or three countries in Eastern uh, Africa where they have a real effect. My own view was, which I advocated and failed, um, 
was that instead of looking at a couple years ago, Tony Blair tried to make the big thing of the G8 increase your assistance by 1%. That's what Bono and others are pushing. I thought a better model was to try to take an area that potentially could be a basket, um, bread basket for an area, whether it's in southern uh, Africa when Mugabe has the grace to finally die, and we could use Zimbabwe that used to be a bread basket, it's now a basket case, or southern Sudan, which is agriculturally rich. Pick, there's areas in southern uh, Asia, for the G8 basically to say, we are going to spend two or three years on one pilot project to try to help develop the infrastructure and the other things it would help not only the people, for example, in southern Sudan, but it would help Chad, Central African Republic, Ethiopia that has periodic uh, famine, et cetera. Um, I think if you did that, you could capture the imagination more than just telling people you're giving more aid. And the American people generally, of course, think we give a lot more aid than we do. Um, in point of fact, some of our Western friends are helpful. We have to look at the model China's doing, where it supports all kinds of thugs in Africa. It builds palaces and stuff, but it also builds infrastructure. And they do it to be able to get first claim on resource extraction. Uh, I wish I had a simple answer. I don't. But I do think, if I go back to my comment earlier, one thing that's positive that the U.S. government's doing today is on the uh, agricultural development and that we can enlist others to do that. Second, that we can uh, do a better job in trying to impose the structural changes that are necessary for prosperity like good governance. And finally, I think one of the great questions of our time is with an emerging China, will they embrace the institutions and values of post-World War II or not? So far, it's a buffet where they pick and choose. And on the development side, it's all driven by trying to secure resources. I think that should be one of our priorities in engaging with them and making them uh, stakeholders uh, as we go forward, which is also in their interest. Um, you're a political man. You know the American political system. And you were the special envoy. I, I can't be too good a Republican man, or, I mean a political man if I was Republican chairman in Illinois. <laughs> <laughs> so you said that, that the activists mobilized Bush or Gore, whichever became president, to appoint a special envoy. What can and does a special envoy accomplish? And if we want to do more than what a special envoy can accomplish, what is the next? Um, In the, in the couple classes I, I've taught here, I always go back, and it's, it's an unsatisfactory answer. It depends. In, 19, in 2008, Bush was exhausted. He had no political capital, and he was engaged in two wars. He cared deeply about Sudan, but there wasn't much give to give. President Obama, you know, in, in pool, if the guy ahead of you leaves a really bad table for you, you call it a bad lie. Barack Obama probably got the worst lie of any president coming in. Plus, he had certain ambitious agendas. And so it's understandable he hasn't cared or been involved in Sudan. So the first challenge in all these is to try to get the attention of the principal and get resources. What can a special envoy do? Uh, first, at least in my case, I want to see George Bush. I saw George Bush within 24 hours. It never mattered. He always made himself available met with him many times, uh, more than most cabinet members. He cared about the issue, and technically he's the only guy I reported to. Uh, and that has a certain bureaucratic value. Uh, also, it helped because the principals on the ground knew I could speak for the President of the United States. And uh, thanks to Bill Clinton bombing a chemical uh, factory in uh, Sudan, I think it was in 99, um, they listened because they were scared what the United States would do. Uh, but the fact is, there wasn't much the United States was willing to do coercively. There wasn't much that uh, France and Britain were willing to do, who were the other major players. And they had a protector in Sudan that gets 6% of its imported oil from Sudan. 
Um, it was the most frustrating, disappointing job I've ever uh, had in government, and uh, I failed. Um, and I often think if I'd been smarter, what might have I been able to do? The United States has the most leverage, but that's not necessarily enough. And in the case of Sudan, um, I left saying that, uh, arguing the last six months that we should jam communications, that we should blockade the Sudan port, and we should blow up one attack helicopter and jam their communication. Those were things that would have gotten their attention. I wasn't elected president. I wasn't responsible for Afghanistan and Iraq and over 100,000 men and women exposed. Uh, I wasn't the president with 30% approval, so the American people weren't with him. Uh, my experience with three presidents is they generally try to make the decision they think is right. I try to be at least somewhat understanding to that decision. Similarly, President Obama made statements as a senator as did Hillary Clinton, as did Joe Biden, as did Susan Rice. I drafted a statement on Sudan and I got McCain, Clinton, and Obama to sign it in late April of 2008 to try to tell the regime that they wouldn't get a get out of jail card at the end of this administration. It's published in the New York Times and elsewhere. It had an effect. Unfortunately, because of the demands otherwise, this administration does, has not exhibited much interest. So I don't envy my successor, General uh, Scott Grasham, who seems to be like that World War I general. He's above the battle and beside the point. It's getting close to the time period in which some of Sudan is going to have its report in the What do you think the international community can do to, A, make sure that that election is your violence where they can make an actual free choice and that Northern Sudan respects that choice? Um, for those who don't know a lot about Sudan, I first quote uh, something uh, that Jacques Klein said to me who was the uh, special representative of the Secretary General in Bosnia after the war. We talk about the Dayton Accords. He said, you had a really, really bloody, messy war, and so you ended up with a really, really bad peace agreement to stop the war. And you don't have high direct conflict going on in Bosnia with all its problems. Jack Danforth cut the same deal. And part of the problem was it had a six-year implementation. So it signed in early 2005. It is my opinion that while negotiations had gone nowhere, for years, they all of a sudden picked up steam in the summer of 2003. Just like in the summer of 2003, Gaddafi decided maybe I don't need these weapons of mass destruction because they were scared what this crazy guy would do after he brought down Baghdad. So they cut a deal. Six year implementation. That's six years for both sides to mess around to try to renegotiate. We cut a deal, change facts on the ground. The final deal is a referendum where the South gets to choose whether it's independent or remains part of southern Sudan. The decision of Khartoum uh, was, well, maybe we can do things to get them feeling like they should be part of us, but probably they're going to leave. So they have continued to sponsor and support ethnic violence and killings in southern Sudan. This last year was particularly bad, with over 5,000 uh, killed by violence in southern Sudan, probably financed by Khartoum. We're approaching an election. Southern Sudan's the size of, size of Texas. It has 50 inches of rain a year, and they have 2.1 kilometers of paved roads. There's no electricity outside of Rumbuk and Juba, maybe one or two other places. When you're there, when you're meeting with President Salva Kerr, it was dependable. You're going to meet with them for three hours. At least two hours, you're going to be in the black because the electricity would go out. So you just continue as if nothing happened. So my view was the stronger southern Sudan is, the more likely the deal is going to be part. So I've argued for greater infrastructure development for the south. I think we should be doing that. 
I think we should provide more capabilities for the South, including surface-to-air missiles. These aren't offensive weapons, but it means if the Sudan Armed Forces fly people down, you can stop it. And I think you should give more. This is something Williams uh, trying to do in a small fashion here at Northwestern. You should give more training. There are 10 people in southern Sudan who run everything. You know, have you ever been to one of those soccer games for six-year-olds? <laughs> heard here, heard there, wherever the ball goes, they don't stay in the field. That's southern Sudan. Luca Bion, Salvador, Pagana Moon, they're all running like those six-year-olds. They need more people trained to be able to run things so they have greater capacity. Um, so I think that's the first thing. The second thing we have to do is uh, continue to provide training for political parties for elections, which both NDI and IRI have been doing. Um, and then the U.S. is going to have to make a really clear statement along with other interested countries that you want a free and fair election and the results honored. Unfortunately, because of what's happened in the last year, we don't have much credibility because Omar al-Bashir became the first head of state indicted by the International Criminal Court for war crimes, crimes against humanity, and ethnic cleansing. And the United States and others' reaction was, oh, isn't that terrible? But they kept dealing the same way. So I'd say that the U.S. is going to have to change postures if you're going to have a successful one, election, so are others. And finally, they have to deal with oil revenue sharing. When this regime came to power in a coup in 1989, the total exports in Sudan was about $400 million a year. Today, it's $9.5 billion, and all the increases from oil extraction. Most of it to China, India, and Malaysia. Unfortunately, most of it's either in contested border areas in the south. And in the last 10 years, both the North and South have become absolutely dependent on that oil revenue. Part of the CPA was oil revenue sharing. They get about $2 billion a year in the South to try to stay afloat. Salva Kerr has made not an irrational decision, which is he buys off militias, so there's not more fighting going on. But it's not going to the development where it could. Again, I'm not sure that's an irrational decision. Neither country, neither... Juba or Khartoum can survive today without that oil revenue sharing. So you have a referendum and they leave, the North will have such a drop in its oil revenue sharing it probably can't sustain itself. So they will probably, if that happens, move troops into the contested areas and you'll have a renewal of civil war. The South cannot get their oil to market. They don't have a port, they don't have roads. The only pipeline goes to the North to the Port of Sudan, one of my great Failures was enough to try to get a negotiated revenue sharing agreement and you str you know It's it's just about money and money. You should always be able to cut a deal on So you say it's a fee for the use of the pipeline to get oil however But uh, it was emotional and it was actually the south that wasn't willing to do it and they're gonna regret it So today I'm not too optimistic. I hope I'm wrong I'm over time. Thank you very much. I appreciate being at Northwestern